It also seems important that as a result of Constantine's favor, the church suffered great harm, and that from then on until the Reformation, there really were two churches. I like to talk about them as the Church of Power and the Church of Piety. Church of Power came into being because Constantine showered so many benefits on the church, it made bishops uh, the equal of senators. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful position to be in the church. And what happened? You have a stampede of the sons of the privileged into the church, some of them becoming bishops before they'd even been baptized. That happened a lot of times. Well, some of these people probably were sincere. They were all worldly. Some of them worldly in the sense that we kind of mean as having suspicious morals, but more of them are really worldly in that they knew how the world worked, they knew how politics worked, they ran the church. But, fortunately, there was this second church based in the monastic movements, which also flourished at the time and which could not be crushed because they were so tightly tied to privileged people, to the nobility, if you will. I mean, as I pointed out about the saints, the sons and daughters of the nobility also went into the church, many of them becoming priests, uh, monks and nuns. And they often were stationed within a few miles from home, visited often, were very close to their parents, and had a lot of influence as a result. Consequently, there was always this struggle between the Church of Piety and the Church of Power, and along about the 11th century, the Church of Piety won out for a while. The Crusades were part of that result. Another part was all of this campaigning for church reform, which when it failed and the Church of Power took over again, led to several centuries of heretical movements and all of the nastiness and bloodiness that that entailed. And then, of course, came Luther's Reformation came out of it partly because of the arrogance of the Church of Power. Meanwhile, the main consequence was not the heresies and not the bloody battles, but the complete neglect of the religion of the people. For centuries, the only chapels you could find in rural areas were the ones of the nobility. They were about the size of modern living rooms. Uh, they were there for the, uh, you know, the Lord and his family and a couple of retainers, and that was it. There simply were no places to go to church even in rural areas, and if we stop and think about 90 to 95 percent of the population lived in rural areas. And what that led to is the fact that religious participation was extremely low, and when churches even did appear, nobody went. There are enormous numbers of reports about people not ever going to church in medieval and late medieval times. And from time to time, they were forced to go to church whereupon they misbehaved. I mean, really misbehaved. And uh, mocked the priest and uh, uh, caused endless trouble, brought their dogs and the dogs barked and, and the women fell asleep and dropped their babies on the floor and, <laughs> and everybody was drunk and it was, you know, it was, it was really something. So what did they do for religion? Because the world doesn't go about the thing. What they did for religion was, of course, magic and kind of quasi-paganism. They added Jesus to the number of, of divinities and went on with life. And the sad part of it is in the long run it just led to the witch hunts. And the irony here is the witch hunts were the result of the commitment to rationality on the part of Christian theologians. Christian theologians have never been content to be like, you know, a, a Buddhist or some of the Eastern religions and just 
Yeah. Here's what it is. And it's all a mystery. And it's all wonderful. They want to know why. And so you sit there and you reason and you reason and you reason. And one of these days, you know, they invented church magic because they wanted to drive out popular magic. And it was the same as popular magic, only they had holy water and, you know, they sign of the cross and various and sundry things involved, which the people then copied. The problem was the church magic couldn't drive out popular magic, partly because the clergy weren't around enough, and secondly, because all magic seems to work equally well. All magic works some of the time. And the problem was, as Christian theologians thought about it, why does non-church magic ever work? We know why church magic works. God makes it work. Jesus makes it work. The saints make it work. We, we know why it works. Why does this other stuff work? Well, it couldn't be God. And very quickly, but it had to be something supernatural. And you know, what do you got left? Well, you got Satan. And you got demons. And that's not good stuff. We got to get rid of it. And, uh, and there you are. Because you see, the people who were brought up on witchcraft charges, most of them were doing something. They were doing magic. The thing that was important, however, is they didn't know anything about Satanism. They were not. They thought they were doing something legit. They were not appealing to demons and the devil and whatnot. There's no a trace of this in any surviving magical writings and whatnot. And it's now accepted by historians that it wasn't there. So then how did it all end? And here comes one of the great ironies. And this isn't my work. This is drawing on some enormously important recent historical work that everybody is ignoring. The witchcraft craze ended largely because of the interference and the model and the writing and the publications of the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition prevented there ever having been a witchcraft craze in Spain or in Italy. Occasionally, although they usually sent them to the galleys, occasionally the Spanish Inquisition punished somebody in re relationship to witchcraft. But it was the people they punished had burned witches. And the Inquisition took a very, very dim view of that and, 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 and stopped it whenever they could and punished anybody who had been involved. Now, how do we know any of these things? The Inquisition, there were two Inquisitions in Spain because there were two parts of Spain. They kept incredibly complete records, enormous files on every case. 44,701 such cases. And the records have all been made available and scholars have been in and plowing through them and quantifying them and now we know a great deal of what went on with the Inquisition. One of the things that went on, and the reason they turned them against witchcraft and witch hunts, is they listened to the first people who came before them charged with witchcraft. They asked them what they were doing, and they listened to their answers, and they discovered that most of them thought they were doing the same thing the priest was doing. And they thought, well, hmm. And they can make him up with a wonderful theological invention. Implicit and explicit invocation of demons. Now, a real witch would be explicitly invoking and say, come, come, come. Yeah. No, these, these darn fools didn't know they were doing that. It was implicit. And you certainly aren't going to burn people when they didn't know they were sinning. And all these people had to do was say they were sorry. They let them go. 
Of the 44,701 cases, as a matter of fact, only 826 people were sent over for execution for any crime. And that amounts to about 10 a year during the course of the Inquisition's history. This at a time when almost every crime in Europe was punished with execution. They, they weren't, look, Henry VIII killed more Lutherans and Catholic priests than the Inquisition had executed in two centuries. And I find the neglect of this negligent. I mean, yeah, why don't we know about it? Well, so I wrote about it. Ah, turning the corner. I want to come to modern times. We've been given an enormous privilege of access to something called the Gallup World Polls. Now they're being done annually in 166 countries. Now, I mean, that means you're down to the little islands and whatnot, okay? And these are done with good, solid national samples and uh, very nice items, a lot of interesting information. And for the first time, we have some pretty good information on things like religious censuses, church attendance, and whatnot. What it shows is that 41% of the people on Earth are Christians. 27% are Muslims, 19% are Hindus, 6% are Buddhists, and you can go from there. Now, we know that a substantial number of these Christians live in Europe and never go to church. So what, what, when we cut, it, cut out some of this nonsense, what do we really get? Well, let's look only at people who have been to a religious service in the past seven days. And 44% of the world's population who've been in church recently are Christians. 29% are Muslims. Most of us would have thought the Muslim proportion would rise a lot compared to the Catholics. So, nah, the Muslims don't go to church either. And you know, they sleep in on Ramadan, whatever. And in any event, I'm very interested in the geography of this. When we look at just nominal affiliations, you've got 13% of Christians in North America, 25% in Latin America, 28% in Europe, 1% in the Middle East, uh, 23 in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now let's move over to weekly attenders. Europe drops out. I mean, it's still 24% in North America, we come up. Latin America, 22. Europe's now only got 13% of them, but get ready for this. 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's the largest single Christian group on Earth. Africa is so Christian and so rapidly growing Christian that it leaves you breathless. So much so that if you go and get a Catholic World Almanac and look up their claimed membership in these, in these sub-Saharan African countries, and then look at the, the Gallup data, you find the Catholics are grossly underestimating their numbers in sub-Saharan Africa. Nobody underestimates their membership, but here it is. You know, 20, 30 percent low. I mean, big low. So I've had some contacts with the Vatican, and they're very pleased about this, but they don't know why. Uh, the, best guess, the best guess is this that uh, the church is growing so rapidly that the priests out in the boonies are able to, to baptize and confirm, but they haven't got any time to keep records, and that it just isn't, get, it just isn't getting counted up. 